Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Meredith. I'm so happy you're here. If you're new, welcome. This is going to be a true crime case today. I'm very excited. I've been wanting to do a serial killer case for a while. So today we are going to be talking about serial killer John Jubert. And I'm just going to do a trigger warning at the beginning of today's case because it does involve young children and themes of sexual assault. So if any of those is something that you don't want to listen to, I'm sure I'll be seeing you in another video. So let's just get right on into today's case. So John Joseph Jubert IV was born on July 2nd, 1963. A lot of times when I am looking into murderers or serial killers, I really like to dive into their childhood and, you know, what brought them to do the things that they do. And a lot, the majority of the time, they have either a bad background growing up, unstable family or childhood. So that's what I'm going to be kind of talking about today, diving into John's childhood leading up to the murders that he will commit. At the age of six, so in 1969, his parents divorced and he went to live in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And he was not allowed to visit his father. I could not figure out why. He did end up living with his mother growing up and their relationship was very strained and he did grow to actually resent and hate his mother for being so controlling on him. So growing up, he, at the age of six, already had a lot of violent thoughts. For example, he had lots of fantasies of violence and even cannibalism when he was very young, around the time of his parents' divorce which probably triggered a lot of these sadistic thoughts that he was having at such a young age. It was said that he dreamed of even strangling his babysitter and eating her body before he was 10 years old. He would later say that those horrific musings were provoked by seeing his father try and strangle his mother. So kind of, he was just at that age taught that that was okay. And it did not stop there. At the age of eight in 1971, his mom moved out of their former house into a really rundown apartment. And at that time he was considered an outcast at school. He did not have a lot of friends and he would compensate for those violent feelings of isolation and he joined the Cub Scouts to try and see if that could help how he was feeling. It was around that time in 1971, his sadistic and homicidal fantasies progressed significantly to the point where he contemplated even just murdering strangers on the street, tying and gagging those who resisted him. This is when he was eight years old still. So he had a lot of those thoughts at that age. A kid that young should not be thinking about that type of stuff. It was said in a later psychiatric report, he was described as saying that he derived pleasure from the thought of his victim saying, quote, if you are going to do it, just get it over with. In 1974, at the age of 11, his family then, him and his mom, and his siblings. I couldn't find much on his siblings, but it was said that he did have siblings. They moved from Massachusetts to Portland, Maine, where he would then spend the rest of his childhood. When he was 13 years old in 1976, he began acting out his violent thoughts. He stabbed a young girl with a pencil and felt sexually stimulated when she cried, so feeling no remorse at the age of 13. The next day, so just one day later from stabbing that girl, he took a razor blade and slashed her 
as he biked past her. He was never caught for either attack, but it was later confirmed that those had happened. In another incident, he beat and nearly strangled another boy. He just relished in the power of bullying and how controlling his victims. And he began to stab and slash others whenever he got the chance. We're gonna fast forward a couple of years. In 1981, when he was 18, he graduated from Chevres High School in Portland, Maine. And it was said from his teachers and workers at the school, his IQ was about 123. So he was a little above average. So he was smart and a lot of serial killers that I've seen and even murderers, a lot of them are really bright and have high IQs. So that's a good thing that I thought I would note in there. And lastly, in 1982, after he graduated high school, during that time when he was in Maine, he joined the Air Force, which eventually took him to Nebraska, where he would later settle. And I just want to note, this case is quite close to where I actually live right now. When I was researching this case, I actually didn't realize that part of it took place in Maine, where I live which I thought was very surprising because I feel like Maine is just the state where like not a lot of stuff happens like this. I just wanted to note that in there that some of the stuff that happens in Maine, like I've been to a lot frequently and recently, kind of touches a little close to home in that aspect. So that was the backstory on John Jubert. We're gonna kind of dive into each of the children and the killing. The first attack and murder was of 11-year-old Richard Stetson. He went by Ricky. I'm going to refer to him as Ricky. His case takes place on August 22nd, 1982. So on this morning, Ricky was just jogging as he was along the three and a half mile running trail in Bat Cove in Portland, Maine. So this one case takes place in Maine. And you know, he was just running like he normally would. He was a pretty fit kid. He usually would go and then come home. But when it started getting dark, his parents called the police because it wasn't like him to not be back before dark. So they definitely got really worried. And not long after, the next day, a motorist along the Interstate 295 discovered a body on the side of the road. It was very quickly determined to be that of Ricky Stetson. The attacker appeared to undress him. He was stabbed and strangled. Not long after his body was found, a suspect was actually arrested in connection to his murder, but his teeth, there was actually a bite mark found on Ricky. The bite mark did not match that of the suspect in Connecticut, so he was quickly ruled out. I just want to note this suspect connection to his murder was finally released due to the bite mark after being in custody for one and a half years. It took them quite a while to rule out this other suspect. And just like that, there were no other leads. The case just kind of went cold on Ricky Stetson until January of 1984. So two years, this case was cold. So that is really all I have on Ricky so far. We are going to move on to the next victim. So in September 18th, 1983, so just one year later, at the age of 13, Danny Joe Eberl was killed. Let's see, leading up to his disappearance and murder, the timeline of events. His last two cases take place in Nebraska. And at this time, John Jubert was in the Air Force and he was living in Nebraska. So one morning, Danny was a newspaper boy and he would always do the same routes and he did it with his friends. They would do the same paper routes every Sunday morning 
And so on this day, he was just doing like what he did every morning. He would ride his bike and he would deliver the newspapers to the families in his street and, you know, connecting streets. His brother, who was actually delivering papers with him, had not seen him for a little while. And he was kind of getting a little worried because they usually wouldn't be separated for too long when they were delivering papers together. But he did remember, his brother remembered being actually followed by a white man in a tan car the previous day. And he thought that might be a little weird, but he didn't really think much of it at the time. During this time, he hadn't seen his brother. He was delivering the Omaha World Herald newspaper in Bellevue, Nebraska with his brother. And it was discovered that morning he had only delivered three out of his 70 newspapers on his route. So he only got to three houses before disappearing and going missing. His dad, Leonard, found his bike that he actually rode that morning and the remaining newspapers that he hadn't delivered yet near the house on his fourth stop. So he had delivered the third, the first three newspapers, and on that fourth stop where he was supposed to go, that's where his stuff was found. His dad said, quote, he loved that bike. He never would have left it there. And his dad also noted that there was no sign of a struggle. So they didn't really have much at the time to go on, just his bike and the newspapers. So it was at that time that his dad reported him missing because he had been gone for a while and he was the type of kid who stick to routine. He wouldn't just, you know, not finish his route, especially with his brother going with him. They always did that. John Jubert would actually later describe how he approached Danny. He drew a knife and covered his mouth with his hand so that he couldn't yell. He instructed Danny to follow him to his truck and drove him to a gravel road outside of town. After three days at this point, they were searching for three days. A body was found in a patch of high grass near a gravel road four miles from his bike. So a body was found and four miles from his bike, which was very weird because that's a long distance for a boy just to go or to be, especially without his bike. The boy was stripped to his underwear, that his feet and his hands were bound. His mouth was taped with surgical tape. There were knife wounds on his body that show that he was tortured before death. And the FBI was called in at this point and they determined nine total stab wounds on his body. One source said eight stab wounds, so you can take that with a pinch of salt. But it's about eight or nine stab wounds. There was no sexual assault though, even though he was found in his underwear. And just like the last case of Ricky, they were both found in their underwear, but they did a rape kit and both did not appear to be sexually assaulted. So it was very, very strange. And that body did be determined as Danny Eberle. So in the case of Danny, there were actually quite a few leads compared to Ricky's. One man was arrested for molesting two young boys a week after this crime of Danny had taken place. He did f fail a polygraph and he had a fake alibi, which was suspicious to police, but he didn't fit the FBI's profile of what they thought Ricky and Danny's killer would be. The police questioned a lot of other pedophiles in the area and questioned them, but there was just a lack of evidence so they couldn't charge any of them. At this time, a local bank in that area in Nebraska offered a $40,000 reward for any information because they were, they obviously had to check on every lead, but no leads were really coming up to anything. And at this point, they were getting a little desperate. A hypnotist was actually called in to help witnesses remember any information in the area at this time. The FBI actually put out a profile of what they believe that the killer of Ricky and Danny would likely be. 
and it is said that he is white, young, and sexually ambivalent. Very vague, but that's just from those two. You know, there wasn't too much information at the scene, DNA-wise, and so that's what they could go on as of now. So after, you know, the leads that they had and the evidence that they collected, sadly, the case of Danny Eberl went cold as well as Ricky's. And this is where we come to our last and third victim. Our third victim is Christopher Walden. He is 12 years old at the time of his murder. His case takes place on December 2nd, 1983. So only a couple months after Danny Eberl's murder. Christopher disappeared in Papillion, I hope I'm saying that right, Papillion, Nebraska on his walk to school one morning. And this actually happened three miles from where Danny Eberl's body was found. So very close to where Danny's case takes place. Witnesses say that the morning of Christopher's disappearance on the way to school, that witnesses say that a white man in a tan car was seen close by again. Now, if you remember, I said in Danny's case that his brother remembered seeing a white man in a tan car driving by a couple days before Danny went missing. So now we have another witness that remembers seeing this. It was later said, John Jubert, when he was telling police that he had, what his timeline of events had that had happened was that he drove up to Walden as he was walking to school in his car. He showed him his knife and ordered him into his car. After driving near some railways out of town, John ordered Chris to strip to his underwear. Chris actually refused to lie down and he struggled. He really put up a fight and he was stabbed in the throat. It was later determined that his throat was cut so deep that he was actually almost decapitated. And on December 5th, three days later, his body was found five miles outside of his town. So there's definitely an MO and similar events that happened. A couple miles out of town from where the boys are found and they're stripped in their underwear. A church nursery school teacher actually reported a man lurking around the school on December 2nd, the day that Chris went missing. She actually managed to write down the license plate number. He actually saw her and screamed at her that he would kill her. She managed to get away and reported that to police. And the license plate that the church nursery teacher managed to get matched the description of a 20 year old John Jubert. And police thought, oh, perfect. He matched the description and the sketches that witnesses had described to police. Now, when police were going through the crime scene of Christopher, they actually noted that it was an unusual type of rope that was found on John's possession that matched the one at the crime scene because it was made in Korea and it perfectly matched the rope that was found to bound Christopher. Now, when police brought John in for questioning after his license plate number was identified, it was not long after that he quickly confessed to murder because he said that he would likely kill again. And whether he felt guilty or remorse, which I don't think he did, he got caught and he just knew that his urges would not stop anytime soon. And they had his car. So he confessed. Let's just compare Danny and Chris's murder. Two murders in Nebraska. The police actually thought that they were quite similar, but at the time of the murders, they didn't make a connection due to some differences. So Chris and his murder, he was bound. He had been better concealed. He was thought to have been killed right after abduction. 
Whereas the first two murders of Ricky and Danny, they were likely tortured, like I said, and kept alive before being murdered. So after the last two murders in Nebraska happened, investigators looked into unsolved murders cases in Maine. And one bore Jubert's signature, Ricky Stetson, the one in Portland, Maine. Like Danny, he had been mutilated and bitten and there was no sign of sexual molestation. So even though these boys were found in their underwear, there was no sign of sexual assault. So now John Juber was arrested on January 11th, 1984. He was officially charged with all three counts of murder. After originally pleading not guilty, he changed it to guilty and was charged with two counts of murder in Nebraska which he got the death penalty in. And in 1990, he was charged with one count of murder in Maine where he did not receive the death penalty. Let's dive into his trials and appeals. So at this time he had been charged with the murders. During his trials, psychiatrists evaluated him and diagnosed him with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, sadistic tendencies, and schizoid personality disorder. Once he was diagnosed with those, he was actually found not psychotic during the murders. So he could not plead insanity. In 1995, so five years after he got charged with the murders, he filed a habeas corpus to overturn the death penalties in Nebraska, but was eventually denied. As his execution date neared, Jubert insisted that he was a changed man, that prison had changed him and that he would never do what he did again and that he deserved freedom. He said he had even found a first love in prison, a woman in Ireland who had been corresponding with him through pen pal. He pleaded for clemency, went to the United States Supreme Court, but in the end, Jubert kept his date with the electric chair on July 17, 1996. That day came up and he was put to death by electric chair. It was said he was actually the second person to ever be executed since the death penalty was put in place in 1973 in Nebraska. And that is really it for this case. There wasn't a lot about the children's, the victims' childhoods, which I wish I could get. I feel like those victims, you know, need all of the attention and how they grew up leading up to, you know, their deaths and disappearances. But I thought it was really, really interesting how from a young age, six years old, like I want to emphasize six years old when John started having those murderous thoughts. That is such a young age. Kids shouldn't be thinking about that at that young age, but a lot of serial killers and murderers, that's just put into their head from trauma and their childhood. And it's really, really sad. But yeah, I'm really glad that the families finally got justice for what they deserve. Even though the first two cases did go cold, it really was solved in a very short amount of time, luckily, thanks to the church nursery teacher writing down that license plate. Because police were finally able to connect all three murders, even the one in Maine, and put John Jubert away. That is really all I have for this case, guys. Thank you so much for sending all the love in my first true crime video. It means the world to me. I love making these. I did so much research and I would love it if you can give me a comment down below of other true crime solved or unsolved cases. This one was definitely interesting and very mind-boggling to cover so yeah all right i will see you guys next time in my next video bye